Ah, back for more. I knew you couldn't get enough of me. That was a big, fat conversation we had for Chapter 1, but now it's time for a, a pretty substantial conversation in Chapter 2, even though this conversation is not going to be as long as Chapter 1. And I don't think any of the conversations that I'll have this semester are, are going to be as long as Chapter 1's, but even though this one will be shorter, it is probably the most important conversation you'll have this semester, and that is because we are talking about the Constitution, which is the bedrock of all political American political power. Now, um, this is something uh, I may write for you a couple times this semester, but there is a totem pole of political power in America, and it generally starts with the Constitution. So the Constitution right here, this is the most powerful political entity in America. Right after that uh, is the Supreme Court. Supreme Court, we'll learn about that in Chapter 12. After that, it's uh, the other courts. Other courts also, very important. Okay, now after that, we have laws passed by Congress, uh, which are then uh, executive orders, uh, are then more powerful than anything in America other than these things above it. And then, of course, you have agency regulations, which is something we'll learn about uh, executive orders in Chapter 10. We'll learn about regulations in Chapter 11. Obviously, we'll learn about the court system in Chapter 12. But, uh, and, of course, lawmaking in Chapter 9. But, uh, obviously, at the very top of this totem pole is the Constitution itself, the most powerful political um, force in America is the United States Constitution. So what we are doing is we are going to take the next however long this conversation ends up being to cover the ins and outs of how the Constitution came to be and of course <clears throat> what it is. So let's start that conversation right now. I do think that uh, there are three chapters more important than any of the other chapters in this textbook, and we'll get to the other ones when we get to them. But chapter two is one of them, and again, for my money, the most important chapter in your textbook. Absolutely make sure you know chapter two. All right, now when we talk about the Constitution, the story of the Constitution is essentially the story of America. Because before America was America, America was a colony. It was a British colony. Great Britain uh, in the 1700, 16 and 1700s had the best um, expansion of their empire across the globe of any other nation, and of course part of that was here in America. This is a, this is a French map, sorry for the French there, for Virginia, or whatever it is instead of Virginia, but it's a good map. It's a good map other than the fact that it's in the wrong language for me. Anyways, there is uh, the, the pop culture understanding of how Ameri what life was like as a British colony for America is that it was agonizing and unacceptable and miserable in every way, like we were living in Mordor or something, uh, and then we declared independence and uh, there are bright days ahead. But that, that's only part of the truth. There are, in fact, benefits for America to be a colony of Great Britain back in the 1600s and 1700s. There are benefits. One of those benefits, you don't have to protect yourself. You're actually protected by the biggest, baddest guy on the block, which in this case was the British colony, the biggest, baddest military the world had ever seen up to that point. Um, now, on top of that, there's also the fact that not only did we get the protection from Great Britain that we wanted, we also got economic connections through Great Britain. Uh, after all, they had long established trade ties with much of the modern, with much of the world, and we got to take advantage of that. So we had relative safety, not perfect safety, of course, because we still squabbled with neighbors, we still squabbled with the in indigenous population. But we had relative safety, and we had relative wealth. The colonies were set up pretty darn well under this arrangement. That being said, obviously there are problems. There are problems with being a colony in the 16 and 1700s. One of those is indisputable. I mean, the fact that we had zero self-determination. Our self-determination came through the crown in Great Britain. We took our marching orders from a guy wearing a crown across the ocean. 
So we had no self-representation. We did have our own governors and mayors, but those guys all had to be approved by the Crown as well. So we didn't have a ton of self-determination. We really didn't have any real self-determination, which is a really big sticking point for many, many decades. And of course, uh, we complained that there's things like the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act, that we felt like we were excessively taxed. Now, there have been historians arguing that maybe America wasn't excessively taxed. I I'm not interested in that debate as far as this class is concerned. What's important is we felt like we were excessively taxed, and what's important is we absolutely didn't have any democratic representation, which led to this cry of taxation without representation. I know you've heard of this before, because you've probably learned about this in grade school. The colonists cried, Tax no taxation without representation. They felt that they were being subjected to this. So, of course, we ended up writing a breakup letter, which is what this was. The Declaration of Independence, written by this very handsome, slave-owning <laughs> guy, um, just calling it like it is. And of course, that's Thomas Jefferson. You need to know his name. You need to know that he wrote, and we issued the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Now, the Declaration of Independence is not laws or anything. Like, there's nothing in the Declaration. You can't be arrested for violating the Declaration of Independence. But this was the letter, the breakup letter, that we wrote the king, saying that, really, uh, if you've read the Declaration of Independence, it's like two pages long. It's in Appendix A in the back of your textbook. It's really only a couple pages long, and really what it is is a laundry list. It's a laundry list of all the things that, all the ways that the king has failed us, right? We believe that the king has failed us in these myriad ways, and as a result, we're out of here. And, and uh, there was a lot of high-minded rhetoric. Now, you don't need to know the high-minded rhetoric here. I'm just showing you this for context. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, unless you're a woman or a black guy, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, uh, white men, of course, deriving their just powers from consent of the governed, unless you're a woman or black guy. So a lot of high-minded rhetoric here, of course. In practice, we had some major holes in our game, but nonetheless, this was, you know, if you've read through the Declaration of Independence, some high-minded rhetoric, some kind of racist, you know, offensive language as well. If, if you read the second page in your textbook of the Declaration of Independence, it says one of the things he doesn't do, he doesn't kill enough uh, Native Americans. <laughs> he doesn't kill enough Native Americans. He's just... Uh, He's not being tough enough on them, and since he's not, that's one of the myriad of reasons why we're declaring independence, so that we can get tough and kill lots of Native Americans. Pretty interesting. Now, on top of that, the whole, the, the thesis statement, really, of the Declaration of Independence, the thesis statement is something called social contract theory. And social contract theory says that people will get together, and they will form their own government, and they'll agree to abide by it which is all fine and good, I suppose. It's a rejection of the monarchy. But the critical thing about social contract theory, it says the government should operate on behalf of the governed. The government should operate on behalf of the governed. Now what that says is, what that says is the government should operate on behalf of the governed, which is the citizenry. We are the citizens. We are the people being governed. It should operate to benefit us. Now, that is a little bit of a switch from how monarchies tend to work. Because in a monarchy, in a dictatorship, everything functions to benefit the governing. Everything is set up to benefit the king. Everything is set up to make the king happy. But we are arguing that the power script should be flipped, that everything should be set up to uh, benefit us, we the people, and since it's not, we're declaring independence. Now, I will let you know, of course, <laughs> this is a PLS 101 class. It is not a history class, so I will not cover a ton of American history here. Obviously, we declare independence. Great Britain says no thank you, so we had a war, which we won. Hooray. Now, <laughs> as of us winning the war, we set up our own government, and we set up that government to be called, there we go, hooray, we set up that government to be called a republic. And a republic is, of course, 
when the power is coming from the ground up. It's when citizens get to exercise self-determination. We get to determine our own courses of action. So if there's a, converse, a national conversation we need to have about how high our taxes should be, how low our taxes should be, it gets handled via the republic, via the people. We, either directly or indirectly through the people we elect, will figure out what tax levels we want. It's not bestowed on us by some king on high. That is what a republic is to say. Now, America is far from the first um, republic to have graced the earth. We were at least 2,000 years late to that game. But we were one of the first republics to put our central governing ideas into a document. And of course, I'm alluding to the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation is one of the first times in human history we take our central governing ideas for a democratic government and we put it in a document which you can call a central governing document. Really just call it whatever that helps you remember it. But it's really the first document that's set up to give us our core rights and freedoms from which all laws flow. That's what the Constitution does today, but before the Constitution was the Constitution, the Articles of Confederation was the Constitution. So the Articles of Confederation is the very first time that we here in America have a central governing document to follow from which all laws will flow. Obviously, we don't have the Articles of Confederation today. We have the Constitution. We'll get to that here in just a few. But what the Articles of Confederation did was it set up America to be what we call a confederation, which is easy enough to remember because it's right there in the name. Do you know what a confederation is? A confederation is really a situation where the states have ultimate authority over themselves. The federal government can't make the states do anything. The states have ultimate authority over themselves. They, they can agree to work together. They can agree to work with one another. But for the most part, if they don't want to work together, they, you can't make a state do something it doesn't want to do. Ultimate authority is with the states. And so if you want to build a road from like Maine to Georgia, you got to go through, you got to ask permission for every state you have to go through. And if there's some state you have to go through, like Pennsylvania, for instance, you can't, can't go from Maine to Georgia on land without going through Pennsylvania. And if Pennsylvania says, I don't want your road to go through my state, well, then you're out of luck. I guess you're ferrying into the ocean now because all your op you, you have no options at this point. You can't force a state to do something that it doesn't want to do. So under this arrangement, America doesn't look like itself. Not the America we know today. Instead, it ends up, America at this time looks like 13 independent countries that are like an alliance that will work together from time to time. But for the most part, each state is kind of calling its own shots as if it was its own country. And that's the way America was set up, at least under the Articles of Confederation. Now, I think that is a pretty straightforward explanation of what the uh, of how the Articles of Confederation works. I think that's a pretty straightforward explanation. I hope it's useful for you, but can we make it simpler? Let's see if we can make it simpler. Articles of Confederation in five words. Here it is in five words. You have strong states, you have a weak central government. That's the Articles of Confederation in five words. The federal government, again, can't make the states do anything. It can facilitate cooperation, but that's about it. Now, it's worth <laughs> keeping in mind that we had just thrown off the shackles of an overbearing foreign government that was bossing us around over all the time. And so the Articles of Confederation was kind of like an overreaction to that. Oh, we don't like the idea of any, uh, you know, we had an empire that was calling all our shots. And so once we declared independence, we kind of overreacted and said, well, we don't want any central governments, uh, governance whatsoever. And so this arrangement, as untenable as it ended up being, was actually pretty popular with the colonists at the time. Now, of course, as I just said, and as you clearly know, the Articles of Confederation did not last. We don't have them today. 
we don't have the Articles of Confederation today. So, what happened? Why did it collapse? Well, folks, not only did the Articles of Confederation collapse, it collapsed in hyperspeed. This document and America under it didn't even last a decade. It took it six, five or six or seven years for this to all go haywire. There were three key problems that we can identify. Problem number one, the federal government had no authority and therefore it was incapable of raising taxes from the states. Now actually, if you read the Articles of Confederation, it says the states should give money to the federal government, but it didn't give the federal government any enforcement mechanism. So as a result, if the states blew off the federal government, they said, I'm not paying my taxes today, I'm not paying my taxes ever again to the federal government, the federal government had to just take it. And so you can easily see a dynamic, matter of fact, it happened, right? It, where a couple states blew off their taxes to the federal government, and then all the other states followed in lockstep. They're like, well, wait a minute, if that state's not paying their taxes, why should I have to pay my taxes? As a result, the federal government was unable to raise any funding. And guys, if the federal government can't raise any funding, it can't provide any services, including the most critical service there is, in my opinion, which is self-defense. Because the federal government couldn't raise money, it wasn't able to provide a military. Now, for the record, this is by design. At the time, public opinion in America was strongly against the idea of a centralized American military run by the federal government. That was really unpopular at the time. Not by everybody, like Alexander Hamilton and George Washington, they really wanted a standing military, but most Americans did not want a standing military. Again, they're overreacting to the fact that they were just governed by an empire that governed them from across an ocean. They were kind of overreacting and saying, all right, well, no central military whatsoever. So this was by design. And so if you're saying something, if we here in the 21st century could very easily say to them in the 1700s, what are you doing? You don't have a federal government. You can't prepare your, you, you can't protect yourself. What if a foreign country comes back and invades? What if Great Britain comes back? By the way, Great Britain would come back in the War of 1812. They burned down the White House. So what on earth are you planning to do here to defend yourself? Well, the, the Americans at the time in the 1700s would tell us, not knowing what would happen in the future, they would say, we don't need a standing military because every state has its own batch of militias. Now, I don't know how much you know about militias in the 1700s, but here's how it works, okay? All across the countryside of, name your state, we'll say Pennsylvania, all across the countryside of Pennsylvania, there's towns, and each of these towns and villages has their own militia. And what happens, it, the militia is just people that live in the town, just people that live in the town. Paul Revere will ride through and say, bad guys are coming, bad guys are coming. And then the town's like, okay, everybody grabs their muskets and their pitchforks, and they go to the city square and they say, okay, who are we shooting at? That's what a militia was like. And these states are all saying, we're fine with militias, that should be enough to protect ourselves. Uh, we don't need a standing military. The problem with that is it wasn't enough to protect itself. And yet the threat that ended up almost toppling America didn't come from a foreign country. It came from inside the house. It was an insurrection, a rebellion called Shea's Rebellion. There's, I guess, a picture of Shea. Uh, Google said that that was a rendering of Shea's Rebellion. Anyways, Shays' Rebellion was a rebellion by a band of really angry farmers. These farmers stormed the countryside because they were upset. They had some taxes raised on them by Massachusetts, and they said, we're not taking this lion down, we're gonna storm the countryside and overthrow the Massachusetts government and just see where things take us. And they were able to you know, there, there's no militia that can really stand up to them. These are hardened Revolutionary War vets. Uh, let's not laugh at the fact that it's just a bunch of farmers. I mean, these guys are Revolutionary War vets, and like 90% of the population was farmers at the time anyways. So they stormed the countryside, and militias aren't really up to the task to stop them. Matter of fact, Shays' Rebellion 
uh, almost ends up taking over the national armory of, uh, of, um, of uh, uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts. The National Armory would have made them maybe the most powerful military force in the country and maybe ends up topple, toppling America altogether. So this is a real serious threat, but enough states kind of cobbled together enough militias to surround them and force them to go home. But America had a choice to make. We are playing with fire here, clearly. We have a system that uh, the next time a band of farmers gets together, the next Daniel Shea, whoever that might be, who decides to organize a bunch of insurrectionists, we might not be able to stave off the next insurrection like we were able to stave off this one. What are we going to do? As they had a long look in the mirror. Obviously, they knew things had to change. And so what they ended up doing was they got about 90 of the smartest guys in their country. Uh, all 13 states sent like their own team of people to something that we now call the Constitutional Convention. Now, we call this the Constitutional Convention now, but that's not what it was called back then because its job was not to write the Constitution. Keep in mind that even after Shays' Rebellion, the Articles of Confederation was still very popular with Americans. So the job that was given to the people that ended up on our money, people we call the Founding Fathers, people that ended up writing the Constitution, their original job was not to write the Constitution. Their original job was actually to repair or fix the Articles of Confederation. Their job originally was to repair the Articles of Confederation. Uh, America is saying to the Constitutional Convention, guys, we really like the Articles, we still want to keep the Articles of Confederation, but we don't want to suffer a rebellion that overthrows America from inside. So can you fix this sucker? Can you put something together with duct tape or, you know, uh, uh, tin foil and paper clips to fix the gigantic hole at the heart of the Articles of Confederation so that we may continue and not have to worry about this ever happening again. Well, a bunch of the people, some of whom end up in the Hamilton musical and end up on your money, people we call the Founding Fathers, take a look through the Articles and they say, this is impossible. There's no way we can keep the Articles the way they are and protect America from the next insurrection or, for that matter, foreign threat. So they end up doing something that they were not allowed to do. They took the Articles and instead of fixing it, they shredded it and they wrote a brand new document in its place. Now this was extremely controversial at the time. Again, this is exactly what they were supposed to not do, but they did it. And of course that document is called the Constitution. Now, the Constitution is a game changer from the Articles of Confederation in many ways, but the most relevant to this conversation is the fact that in Article 1, Section 3, you don't have to know that part, but you do, not, you do need to know that in the Constitution there is something called the Supremacy Clause. It's in Article 1, Section 3, and it says that now the federal government can tell the states what to do. The federal government now has the authority to boss the states around. Didn't have that authority under the Articles, but it now has that authority under the Constitution. So this is real controversial because now we are essentially creating a brand new gigantic federal government that will span the entire country and be more powerful than all 13 states combined. And because this is such a big deal, this, uh, we are now creating the biggest, baddest government that this young country had ever seen. There was intense debate from all 13 states over what that government should look like. Now, among the 13 states, the most influential was the state of Virginia only. Peek over here. Because <laughs> uh, my, looks like my Tennessee and North Carolina here is dark. The whole thing with this PowerPoint is that uh, <laughs> some, if it's ever dark on the screen, it becomes invisible. Anyways, the most influential of all 13 states at the time was Virginia. 
First of all, because it was a big state. But second of all, because a lot of the heaviest constitutional hitters came from Virginia, including, uh, you know, including Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, uh, including people like James Madison. These are some of the most influential uh, of the founding fathers. And they introduced something called the Virginia Plan. Now, the Virginia Plan, out of the, out from the Virginians, um, introduces the idea of three branches of government. And guys, if you don't know your three branches, you better know it now. I'll say that again. If you don't know your three branches, if you don't know your, it's supposed to be a star, and it's supposed to be over here. If you don't know your three branches, you better know it now. Okay? Make sure you know your three branches. Okay, so what are the three branches? Well, you have a legislative branch, talked about in Article 1. You need to know that. And it makes the laws. You have an executive branch, talked about in Article 2. You need to know that. And it enforces the laws. And then you have a judicial branch, talked about in Article 3, which interprets the laws. Okay? So you need to know everything in that corner right there. Now, I will say that each of these three all get their own chapter down the road. You have chapter 9, chapter 10 and 11, you could say, gets executive branch 10 and 11, and then uh, judicial branch chapter 12. So we'll get into those chapters before long. But for now, make sure you know the basics. Make sure you know all three branches. Make sure you know what each does. We call this separation of powers because you're taking all the power of government and you're separating it between three branches. Only one of the branches can make the law. Only one of the branches can enforce. Only one of the branches can interpret. And make sure you know what part of the Constitution talks about each. Now, like I said a moment ago, this was generally very popular. Virginia was packed with brilliant guys. One, you know, at the foremost of that was James Madison. Um, but, um, despite the fact that this separation of powers dynamic was pretty popular, there was a ton of debate about this in particular. What should the legislative branch look like? Because at the end of the day, every law that we follow in America will be written by this branch. So, what should the branch look like? Virginia had some ideas. Now, Virginia first believes that this legislative branch in other words, our eventual Congress, should be bicameral. Bicameral. Do you know what that word means? Make sure you know what bicameral means. Somebody listening to my voice right now is going to get the bicameral question wrong on the exam. Don't let it be you. You hear me? Okay, so uh, don't get this question wrong. But bicameral, this means, maybe I can mark it down here. This right here, that means two, and uh, this part means houses. Two houses, okay? Bicameral means two chambers. Make sure you know what bicameral means. It means two chambers. Now, these two chambers are going to benefit big states like Virginia, because you're going to have a lower chamber. The lower of the two chambers will split up the seats in the legislature based on population. So if you're a big state like Virginia, and like Pennsylvania, and like New York, you're going to end up with a lot of seats in the legislature. If you're a smaller, uh, if you're a smaller government, like, I'm sorry, if you're a smaller state, like Rhode Island, like Delaware, well then you're not going to end up with many seats. Now on top of that, you're also going to have an upper chamber. And the upper chamber <coughs> will have its membership decided by the lower chamber. So big states are able to get a lot of representation in the lower chamber, and then they can really stack the deck for themselves in the upper chamber. This isn't rocket science. When I ask you which states really like the Virginia plan, the answer is, of course, big states. The answer is big states. Big states love this arrangement because it gives them a ton of representation. That was a proposal by Virginia. Uh, big states like it, and obviously small states 
hate it. So small states counter with their own plan called the New Jersey plan. And the New Jersey plan features a lot less distinguished people than Virginia. But nonetheless, it's a plan that favors, you guessed it, small states by offering a unicameral legislature. Unicameral, guys, unicameral. That means one house, okay? One house. You will have a single chamber. And in that single chamber, you're going to have every state represented equally. Every state will be represented equally. Rhode Island, one seat. Maine, one seat. New Hampshire, one seat. New York, one seat. Virginia, one seat. This is a great arrangement if you're a small state. Because if my state has like 12 people in it, but your state has a million, I still get the same number of, uh, same number of votes as you do in this legislature. Um, so this is a great deal if you're a small state. Obviously, big states hate it. They shoot it down. Small states threaten to upend the entire Constitutional Convention. So a middle ground is reached in something called the Connecticut Compromise. Now, this is also known as the Great Compromise. And guys, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you right now, trust me when I tell you this is true. So long as you know at least one of those two, you're going to be fine. If you know it as the Connecticut Compromise or if you know it as the Great Compromise, you're taken care of on the exam that we'll have here before long. Don't worry about it. But yeah, you need to know at least one of those. Now, uh, the Connecticut Compromise tries to find a middle ground between the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan. And it finds that middle ground by creating a Congress that is bicameral, which we have just talked about. I hope by now you still you remember from two minutes ago what bicameral means. Bi, like bicycle, means two. So you're going to have two chambers, folks. You're going to have two chambers. So already we're looking pretty Virginia-y. Also looking virginia E is the lower chamber, which we today call the House of Representatives. We'll talk about that more in Chapter 9. But the House of Representatives will split up its seats in the House by population. So you will have big states with more representation. In this day and age, I'm talking to you in 2021, the state of California has 53 seats in the House of Representatives. The smallest state in America, Wyoming, has one seat, okay? So California is massive compared to Wyoming, and as a result, it has a ton of seats in the House. So right now we're looking pretty Virginia-y, but the wrench in the system comes in the upper chamber, which we today call the Senate. And in the Senate, the seats are split up equally. Every state gets the same number of senators, which in this day and age is two. Every state gets two senators that represent the entire state. Missouri has eight people in the House, two people in the Senate. Why two people in the Senate? Because every state has two people in the Senate. So the upper chamber favors small states, the lower chamber favors big states. Here's the kicker though, you cannot get a law passed out of Congress unless both sides approve of the legislation. You can't get anything passed out of Congress unless both sides approve. That way, Big states can't unilaterally pass a bunch of stuff screwing over the little states, and the little states can't pass a bunch of unilateral stuff that's screwing over the big states, okay? Now, I mentioned this for a couple different reasons. First of all, it's important that you know how Congress is, uh, is put together. But second of all, because this is what lawmaking looks like. This is what governing looks like. You are, too often... We talk about the people who are our founding fathers of America, the framers of the Constitution. We talk about them as if they were faultless gods on earth that came up with our constitutional system because they thought it was truly best for, them, for America as a whole. But we are looking at this right now, and what you are seeing is two greedy groups of people trying to screw over the other side. Small staters came up with the New Jersey plan, not because they thought it was morally superior, but because it would have favored them. Big states came up with the Virginia plan, not because it served some higher purpose, but because it would have benefited them. So both greedy groups met in the middle and came up with a system both of them are kind of okay with. Okay? So that's generally why we talk about this. Compromises, to this, and it happened in the 1700s and it's happening in the 21st century. 
Compromises are extremely difficult. You have to give up your left leg in order to get, you know, in, in order to get some of the stuff you wanted. Not even all of the stuff, just some of the stuff you wanted. You have to give up a lot of yourself. And sometimes the compromise works. I mean, I don't think anybody's super happy with how Congress is these days, but it's like a relatively functional system. Other times, compromises don't work out very well. And at the Constitutional Convention, there were as many bad compromises as there were functional compromises. One of the big challenges of the Constitutional Convention was to keep the slave states in the fold. If you could keep the slave states in the fold, your country would be twice the size. They didn't want to lose the southern half of America. So, what were some of the compromises that they made to keep the slave states in the fold. Of course, these are states, in case you're completely foreign to this, slave states are states that allow uh, the ownership of other humans as slaves, where they have no rights and they are not paid for their forced labor. Now anyways, the biggest compromise was continuing to allow slavery to exist. That was probably the biggest compromise, because you know, roughly half of America did not like the institution of slavery. They weren't uh, progressive by any means. All of America was super racist. But the northern half of America did not have the institution of slavery. The southern half of America did have the institution of slavery. So what do you do in the Constitution? Do you write that slavery is okay and you lose your northern half of the country? Or do you write that slavery is not okay and lose your southern half? Well, what the founders did was they punted on the issue. They didn't address slavery one way or the other. Matter of fact, the word slavery isn't even mentioned in the U.S. Constitution until the 13th Amendment, which bans slavery. So they really do everything they can to avoid bringing up slavery in the Constitution as a way to kick the can down the road and allow for the country to stay intact. Guys, let's call this what it is. Let's call this what it is. This, what you're looking at right now, this is America's deal with the devil. We allowed slavery to continue and languish millions of Americans uh, who were enslaved in slavery in order to not lose the slave states and keep the whole country intact. It was a deal with the devil we made that, for the record, a century later almost shredded the country in half in the Civil War. So obviously not every compromise works out very well. Slavery, one unseemly compromise. Another unseemly compromise is how we wanted to count enslaved people um, for population purposes. Now, obviously, they had no real rights whatsoever. The southern states, however, wanted them still to be counted one as, as a full person for population purposes to give them more representation in Congress. The northern states said, well, hold on, you're giving these people the same rights essentially as mules we're not going to do that. Uh, you're not going to be able to count them as a full person. And so a weird series of compromises uh, comes and goes, and the next thing you know, um, now these enslaved people count as three-fifths of a person for population purposes. Another unseemly compromise, uh, something that we still squabble over today, is over what we call the Electoral College. Guys, what you're about to see is going to be a lot of rigmarole right down here over how we elect the president. I don't need you to know it. Not yet, anyways. We'll get into that in chapter 8. However, I do need you to know that we have something called the Electoral College today, which was the result of a weird series of compromises. Okay, That's what I need you to know. We elect the president using the Electoral College, which was the result of a weird series of compromises. Okay? And really, the fight here was who should end up picking the top um, governing figure in America. Who should end up picking the president? Should it be the general population? Should it just be a general population vote? Well, southern states didn't like that because the North had more people. So what do you do? Well, you know, instead the Electoral College kind of marches to the beats of the Three-Fifths Compromise, which boosts the population of the southern states. You don't need to know any of that right now. We'll get into some of that in Chapter 8. So after a series of compromises, we end up with a constitution. 
which is based on four key ideas, what we call the four pillars of the Constitution. And I know what you're thinking right now. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, are we talking about the four pillars of the Constitution right now? And you have a picture of a building with four pillars? <laughs> oh, Mr. Crocker, you know what you're doing. And uh, to that, I say thank you for noticing. I appreciate the compliment. I'm glad that you appreciate how much work I put into this for you. Anyways, four pillars of the Constitution, four key ideas that make the Constitution the Constitution. Let's talk about all four of them. The first is republicanism. Now, this doesn't have anything to do with the Republican Party. Don't worry about that. It just has to do with the Republic. Power comes from the ground up. It comes from consent of the voters. Republicanism is self-determination. Which the Republican Party believes in, but... Uh, as I said in a previous lecture, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, those are just team names. Those are just team names. Might as well be the Chiefs and the Buccaneers. Okay, They're just team names. We'll get into that later. I hear that from time to time. People are like, uh, um, they'll say, you know, they're called the Democratic Party because they favor democracy and the Republican Party because they favor republics. That is not, that is not true. <laughs> They're just team names. Okay, yeah, just team names. Anyway, so pillar number one of the Constitution is republicanism. Pillar number two, we're talking about in chapter three, federalism. Chapter three is all about federalism. So I don't care if you know much about federalism right now. Because that's all, we're, we'll be diving deep into federalism on chapter three. So for now, just understand, federal, federalism argues that the federal government deals with federal-level things, state governments deal with state-level things, local governments deal with local government things. That's all you need to know right now. But um, chapter three, which is the very next chapter, the very next video you're clicking on, we are diving deep into chapter three, into federalism. Anyway, so let's skip past that for now. And the third principle is something we talked about with the Virginia Plan, which is separation of powers, we, which I, I love that term. I love terms that tell you exactly what they are. I wish more terms would do that. Federalism is one of the worst terms. You read that and you're like, what does that mean? But separation of powers, literally we take three branches and we separate governmental powers between those three branches. You remember what all three branches do? Let's review right now. Legislative branch makes the laws, Article 1. Executive branch enforces the laws, Article 2. Judicial branch interprets the laws, Article 3. So that's what separation of powers is. Don't confuse separation of powers with checks and balances. Don't confuse that. Because checks and balances says each branch has the ability to check the power of the others in order to theoretically keep them balanced with one another. Most obvious example, that's the veto, right? Veto, the president can veto a bill passed by Congress, and then Congress can override the president. You see how those two branches of government are overriding one another? They are checking each other's power. So that right there is the four pillars of the U.S. Constitution. All right, let's keep on moving. The nice thing about this being a video is you can always pause me. Okay, pause me right now. You can always pause me if you want. Okay, so, guys, we have all these people known as the framers of the Constitution. We send them all to Philadelphia in 1787 to write the, con to write, to end up, they end up writing the Constitution. And they kick the doors open after a few months. And they say, uh, here's the Constitution. And America's like, what? I thought you were supposed to be fixing the articles. They were like, we didn't do that. <laughs> Instead, we wrote the Constitution. So that means America has to follow the Constitution, right? We have a new founding document. People called the Founding Fathers break open the door to America. And they say, here's the Constitution. Do we have to follow it? The answer is, no, we don't have to follow it because we're a democracy. We don't have to follow the Constitution unless we agree as a society to follow the Constitution. We don't have a bunch of rich people 
hanging out in the Constitution Hall or wherever. They write a brand new document, and now we all have to follow it. That's not how America works. That's not how our republic works. We, as a society, end up having a year-long debate over whether we should adopt the Constitution or not. Now, this debate is between two groups of people. One group of people are called the Federalists. One group of people are called the Federalists. I already gave you an assignment on this. Uh, your assignment, of course, was to write about Federalist Paper Number 10, Federalist Paper Number 51. We'll talk about both of those here in just a few. Anyways, Federalists argued for the Constitution. Anti-Federalists argued against the Constitution. Okay? Now, for the record, they didn't call themselves anti-Federalists at the time. They called themselves a couple different things. They didn't call themselves anti-Federalists, but clearly they, have, they lost the debate. And so history has branded them anti-Federalists. Anyways, let's give that a moment to sink in. Anti-Federalists, roughly half of America was opposed to the Constitution. In this day and age, that's blasphemy. We talk about the Constitution today like it's the Bible or something. Why would somebody be opposed to the Constitution? Well, let's explore those reasons. Why were anti-federalists opposed to the Constitution? Let's talk about it now. Reason number one they were opposed to the Constitution is because they were really worried about the fact that we were taking all the power from 13 states. I shouldn't say all the power. Most of the power from 13 states and kind of conglomerating it into one national government. So they were worried that we were putting too much power into too few hands. Hold on a minute, anti-federalists would say. They'd say, like, wait a minute. You're taking all that power, and you're putting it in the hands of one guy who's going to live in a white house on the East Coast in some city I'll never see in my entire life? That sounds like a lot, that sounds a lot like the king we just got done defeating in the Revolutionary War. So they're really worried about, like, replacing one tyrant with another. Second of all, they were really concerned about these things called factions. You read about them in Federalist Paper Number 10. Factions is just a fancy way of, is a 1700s fancy way of saying interest groups, which we talked about a little bit already. We'll talk about more in depth later. But these interest groups are groups of Americans who are organizing politically and trying to influence the government. And the concern of the Anti-Federalists was that these groups would get so big and so powerful that they would manipulate the government. They would manipulate the government and play it like a puppet. So they were worried that interest groups would get too big and too powerful. Now, under the Articles of Confederation, you would have to manipulate all 13 states simultaneously if you wanted to make, you know, if you wanted to manipulate America. But if you have one federal government that's supreme, You've really cut down the work of these uh, uh, interest groups in that regard. Now, on top of that, there was a... You have to keep in mind what the Constitution looked like at the time. The Constitution at the time was only the seven articles that you have read for this chapter. Only the seven articles of the Constitution. None of the amendments had been added yet. And that's important because the amendments are where we get all of our individual rights. If you don't have any amendments, that means no individual rights are in your Constitution yet. And so that was a concern of anti-federalists, was I see a lot of stuff about the government in this document, but I don't see squat about individual rights. So if you don't have something in the Constitution that says Americans have freedom of speech, then what's to keep the government from repressing my freedom of speech? This was an anti-federalist argument at the time. So these three arguments are fair. I think they're fair arguments against the Constitution. I, I think this is a, a fair argument being levied again, uh, being leveled at the Constitution on behalf of the Anti-Federalists. Now, of course, we had to get ourselves some responses from the Federalists. And the Federalists issued their responses in this now famous series of essays called the Federalist Papers. You've read two of those Federalist Papers for today, uh, for at least for this chapter, I meant to say. That's chapter 10, uh, Federalist Paper 10 and Federalist Paper 51. So they, they had to respond to each of these arguments. Okay? 
So what about that first argument? The first argument is saying too much power in too few hands. Okay, now keep in mind, the Federalists, many of the most prominent Federalists, wrote the Constitution. So this is their baby. And here are the Anti-Federalists crapping all over. Well, guys, I'm telling you right now, the Federalists are going to look those Anti-Federalists right in the eyes and they'll say, too much power, too few hands? It, maybe. Maybe we've done that. It's possible we've done that. It's possible we have. But at least now, even though we may have done that, we have at least now made the government strong enough to put down any faction violence. So, which was another way of saying any rebellions. The next rebellion that comes along, we will be able to put it down. And by the way, after the Constitution was ratified, there was another rebellion, just like Shays Rebellion. This time, it was called the Whiskey Rebellion. And I'll let you guess what taxes they were protesting. And I think it was in Pennsylvania, but a bunch of farmers, once again, are storming the countryside. Only this time, they are met by George Washington on a white steed backed by 10,000 troops. And George Washington said, you may go home now, and we won't turn you inside out and kill all of you. So that ended that rebellion. So anyways, this point ended up being pretty astute. Now what about that second argument? The idea that there can be large interest groups, known as factions, that could end up manipulating the American government. Guys, uh, responding to this second argument is what Federalist Paper 10 was all about. Federalist Paper 10 is tough. It's a tough read. 51, not that bad. 10 is pretty tough. Here's what Federalist Paper 10 is trying to say. It is saying it is possible that there could be tyranny of factions. They're saying it is possible that this could happen. It's just unlikely. Okay, I'll give you just a moment on that. Anyways, so they are arguing that it is possible there could be these large interest groups that manipulate America like a puppet. It's just unlikely. And it's unlikely, they argue, they are arguing this, it's unlikely because America is so big and diverse. America is so big and so diverse, you're going to have a gajillion of these interest groups. They're going to be all over the place, fighting each other all the time, and no one of them could get big enough and powerful enough because of all this conflict. There is this, uh, there's a show still on called The Simpsons, but when I was growing up, it was a very funny show. And uh, they, there's this show, there's this character on The Simpsons, Simpsons called Mr. Burns. And Mr. Burns is like a 200-year-old billionaire that runs the city of, the fictional city of Springfield. And uh, he goes to the doctor on this TV show. And the doctor runs a bunch of charts on him. Again, he's like 200 years old, really weak, frail old man. So the doctor comes back in and he says, well, Mr. Burns, uh, we ran all the tests and it turns out that you have all the diseases. But they're fighting each other, so you should be fine. <laughs> okay, That's the argument that they're making here. The argument that the, the Federalists are making is that these interest groups, they'll be a dime a dozen. They'll all fight each other all the time. It's unlikely any one interest group could get powerful enough to manipulate the American government. It's possible. It's just unlikely. What about this third argument? Because there's no real way you can say nuh -uh to the fact that there's no list of individual rights. There was no list of individual rights. The amendments had not yet been added. So they argued, you don't need a list of individual rights. There's any number of reasons why you wouldn't need a list of individual rights. The primary reason they argued was because the Constitution is only a document that says what the federal government can do. Therefore, if it's not in the Constitution, it's implied the federal government can't do it. There's nothing in the Constitution, they argued, that the federal government can take away your freedom of speech. Therefore, the government can't do it. Now, does that argument make sense? Sure. Is it persuasive? No. Right. Matter of fact, we, I mean, hey, maybe it is persuasive to you, but I'm Missourian. Okay? I'm from the show-me state. 
Don't tell me. I just did it again. I'm from the show me state. Don't imply for me that I have freedom of speech and freedom of religion. I want to flat out see that I have freedom of speech and freedom of religion. I want to flat out see it. So, public opinion started turning against the Constitution on this last argument here. And so, the people that we now call the Founding Fathers put their hands up, the Federalists put their hands up, and they said, you know what, maybe we got it wrong, guys. Maybe we got it wrong. At the end of the day, maybe we should have included a list of individual rights. So tell you what, we'll do that. And they wrote a list of amendments that we call the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights was, the, was 12 amendments generally that eventually all got approved. But right out of the gate was the 10 that you and I may know relatively well. I know you know the First Amendment okay, right? The Second Amendment too, right? But the First Amendment says freedom of speech, uh, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press. Freedom of petition. Second Amendment. Right to bear arms. Third Amendment. I don't have to house soldiers in my home if I don't want to. Fourth Amendment. I have um, protection from unreasonable searches and seizures. Fifth and Sixth Amendment are all about due process. The Seventh Amendment is about civil juries. The Eighth Amendment says no cruel and unusual punishment. The Ninth Amendment says weird amendment that says there are other rights we haven't specified. And the Tenth Amendment says anything we haven't mentioned belongs to the states or to the people. So these first ten amendments are all just individual rights. And once you've added them, it's hard for the anti-federalists now to argue, well, there's no individual rights, because now there's individual rights. So that deflates that third argument being made, there we go, that third argument being made by anti-federalists, and the Constitution then became popular enough to get ratified. Ratified is a fancy way of saying approved. That's the story of the Constitution. Now, there is one more thing I do want to cover uh, on the Constitution, and that's the fact that it is often nicknamed a living document. Uh, it, it, we, off, we sometimes nickname it the living Constitution. And we say it's alive because it can change. And there are several ways the Constitution can change, but two really critical ones that we need to know two of the most aggressive ways to change the Constitution. Now, obviously, the first is that you amend the Constitution. If you amend the Constitution, you can change it. Tack on an amendment. But let me ask you right now, do you know the answer to this? How do you change the Constitution? How do you add an, uh, let me say that again. How do you add an amendment to the Constitution? Do you know the process? Do you? It's a two-step process. Make sure you know it. Okay? Make sure you know it. Step number one, you need to propose the amendment, and it takes a whopping two-thirds of the House and a whopping two-thirds of the Senate just to propose the amendment, just to propose it. So not simple majorities where you have one more yay than you have a nay. Okay, You need massive super majorities. Two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate need to agree. This has happened 33 times in American history. 33 times. Now, 27 times we have seen success at the second step. And the second step, after Congress officially proposes successfully, we kick it down to the states, and you need three quarters of the states. Three quarters of the states are then needed to approve in order to ratify the amendment. And then it gets added to the Constitution. And this has happened 27 times. Really, the first 10 amendments were added lickety split. So really, after the first 10 amendments, this really only happened 17 times over the course of American history. So amendments are rare. We haven't had a new amendment added since 1993. Okay, so it's been whatever the math is on that, roughly, roughly 20 years. Three-fourths. Now, I'm not asking you to do the math on that, but out of 50 states, it means 38 states. You need 38 states. You need 38 states to approve of something in order for it to be added to the Constitution. Anyways, that is the first and best known way. I mean, you knew about constitutional amendments before you took this class. You might not have known about how exactly to add them, but make sure you know it. Make sure you know it. Now, interestingly enough, 
These amendments happen once a generation, but there is another way the Constitution changes. And matter of fact, it changes this way uh, tens of times a year. It changes several times a year via judicial interpretation. Judicial interpretation. This doesn't capture the public attention as much. This doesn't capture the public attention as much as amendments do. But it actually affects the Constitution dozens of times a year. Let's talk about what this means. Now, please keep in mind, one of the things that we know about the Constitution is that it is really, really vague. The Constitution is really, really vague. For instance, the Eighth Amendment says, no cruel and unusual punishment. But the Eighth Amendment doesn't define cruel and unusual punishment. So what's cruel and unusual? I don't know. So what we do is we leave it up to the courts to figure out what certain vaguenesses in the Constitution mean. And over time, our society develops. Our society is very different in the 21st century than it was in the 1700s. Since we evolve, our culture evolves, and the judges evolve with the culture. Back in the 1700s, tarring and feathering, not that unusual. Okay. In the 21st century, tarring and feathering, absolutely cruel and unusual. As judges change their interpretation over the generations, the Constitution changes with them. Okay? Most Supreme Court cases you'll never hear about because they deal with relatively minute things. But every now and then, I mean, they do decide big things, and really all the rulings do have an impact on the United, almost all the rulings have an impact on the United States Constitution. Is that confusing? The second one, is this one, second one confusing? Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example of what we call judicial interpretation, also known as judicial review. Here's what I mean. Let me give you an example. Here's part of the 14th Amendment. Now, you don't need to know constitutional language. Okay? You don't need to know constitutional language in my class. I'll never ask you to recite this. But part of the 14th Amendment says that there must be equal protection of the law. There is no definition of what equal protection under the law means. So that leads us to a debate in the 21st century over gay rights, LGBTQ rights. Now, prior to the 21st century, the Supreme Court never ruled that the Constitution defends gay marriage. If straight people could get married, gay people should be allowed to get married too. Guys, that didn't happen until like 2014. Okay, so up till 2014, the Constitution never defended the institution of gay marriage. It never defended it. Therefore, the 14th Amendment did not defend it. Now this changed. Back in like 2014 or so, I forget the exact year, um, the Supreme Court changed its mind. Okay, 2014. The SCOTUS, by the way, is Supreme Court of the United States. Just letting you know that. But anyways, the Supreme Court did rule in 2014 that it did. That equal protection does apply to gay marriage. If you're going to allow straight people to get married, you must also allow gay people to get married. So as of 2014, the Constitution has changed, and now it does defend gay marriage. Okay, so there is an example of how, over time, judges can affect uh, the Constitution and how it, how it works, how it applies. Okay? All right, so that's really all I have uh, in the, uh, on the docket for Chapter 2. I hope this was enlightening and digestible. If you have any questions about anything you've read here or elsewhere, feel free to shoot me an email. Take care.